Well done. So that means okay. we can start uh, with uh, our next talk, Migrating from Adobe Connect by Jess Portnoy. Thank you, Jess. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me today. So today we'll be talking about good deeds, specifically migrating from proprietary software onto freedom. Uh, this is my good deed of the season. And uh, before I start, are there any Adobe fans in the crowd? Because you shan't like this session. If you do like Adobe, um, just warning you. Right, so look up the dictionary definition of Adobe. Essentially a brick. Uh, but what is it really? So it's a platform for virtual presentations and conferencing. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like, just so you get the general revolting idea. So it looks like that. Sadly, uh, we couldn't get customer consent to share the actual platform. So I'd have to show you some screenshots. Those who know me know I love to demo. There will be a live demo, but in parts. So I had to be creative. I couldn't show you the whole thing, sadly. But such is life. So it looks like that. So there's a presentation. They call them pods. I prefer the word widget, but never mind. So we've got this pod, we've got one for chatting, we've got several others, and uh, they can appear or not appear depending on the uh, presenter's desire. So this is what we're about to talk about. Um, back to our presentation. Right, so uh, recently, as all good projects, this started late at, late at night, and our co-founder called me, and she said, hey Jess, how are you doing? Like, um, well, I was fine until now. What's down? And she's like, no, it's nothing like that. Uh, we have a project we may need your help with. And I'm like, okay, sure. What is it? And she said, well, speak to Jack. That's a solution engineer in our uh, company. I work for Kultura, by the way. So I've spoken to Jack, and he says, uh, listen, we have this customer, and he uses Adobe Connect. I'm like, blimey, what's Adobe Connect? And he's given the pitch I've just given you. And I said, well, all right, you know, so I'm an optimist. I figured, you know, I'll use their API, I'll get the video file, and then I'll migrate it onto our platform using our APIs. Please, right? I'm an optimist. I was born this way. I keep trying to change. So, no, it's, it's not that easy, apparently. So after uh, doing some research, I've discovered that, yes, they do have an API of sorts, but you can't obtain one cohesive file representing the Adobe Connect session. Uh, there are multiple files, and you have to assemble them. And they're naturally, Adobe being Adobe, they're FLVs, right? They're Flash files. And they're not all independently playable either. So I said, yay, fun. Uh, by that time, it was about quarter to 12. So I gave it a rest for a few hours, and I came back in the morning. Uh, now, I'll walk you through what I've done, which is basically using leveraging open source software in order to migrate from that, from what I've just described. I'm not allow allowed to cost during uh, my sessions, so I shan't do. But it's, well, let's go with rubbish. Uh, so I've used FFmpeg, Selenium uh, with Mozilla's Gecko driver, OpenCV, and Using all these tools, I've managed to produce video files representing these sessions and migrate from this platform to our own open source platform uh, called Cultura. Now, I'll show you demos in parts because, like I said, sadly, I can't show the whole thing. But uh, we'll have fun. I promise. We will do. Okay. So, to start with, uh, we needed some metadata, and for that we could use the API, so we have done. There are multiple clients that can be used to retrieve such data. Uh, I chose the Adobe Connect Ruby client. Uh, there's, this is an actual link, so if you need that, you could use it. Um, what, the reason why I chose Ruby, other than it being a very nice language, is that I've already had some code that does some Selenium work. Uh, is anyone familiar with Selenium? Some people are, good. It's very nice. So it's essentially um, a browser automation framework. So you need to perform actions within a browser, and you don't want to do it with your hands, you can use Selenium. Uh, very convenient bindings with lots of languages, not just Ruby. I just happen to have had some code written in Ruby already, so I figured, you know, I'll save some time. Uh, so I've done this. 
Now, using that uh, Adobe Connect client, I was able to fetch some data, such as uh, the asset name, the URL to obtain it, uh, its duration, sometimes. And it turned out to be uh, inaccurate, too. But you know, it looked promising to begin with. Uh, and who owns it? So for that portion, I've used the Adobe Connect Ruby client. Of course, this is not an official Adobe client. Someone just had that problem and has written uh, a solution for it. But it was a good solution. So if you ever need it, I, recommend, I can recommend it. So obtaining the assets. Uh, essentially, to properly appreciate what needs to be done, like I said, there's no one video file kept within that system representing the entire session. Uh, it's segmented, so there are files for the audio, others for the video, and there are multiple files for each of those. Uh, and then you've got the widgets. So assembling audio and video files is very easy with FFmpeg. That's not a project. That's like five minutes' work. But uh, because of these additional FLVs, and let's return to what this thing looks like. So these pods, right? These are FLV files where the data is stored, and these cannot be, the data cannot be extracted without writing code in Flash, which I certainly did not want to do. So I had to find a different solution for it. The solution I came up with, I figured, OK, fine. So I'll use Selenium. I'll, I'll launch a web browser. I'll navigate to the recording and load it using their uh, SWF file, right? their software, their Adobe software. I'll play it using that software, and I'll record the entire thing using FFmpeg and X11 Grub. So I'm essentially automating the process of navigating to that URL, and then recording the whole screen display, the X screen display, using FFmpeg. And then I manipulate that file further, as I'll uh, walk you through. So this is what I did, and uh, it worked quite well. Worked quite well, but I had several difficulties. So let me show you what such a file looks like for those of you like me who lack imagination. Let's find that zip file. Now, usually people ask me to increase the font. Is that all right? Can you see okay? Okay. Right, so this is a typical archive. Um, they do vary, though. So each asset I've found had, well, not each, but there were several different formats I had to tackle uh, in order to get this done. And also, they've had a combination of various versions of Adobe Connect, so 8 and 9, and the format wasn't quite the same, and metadata was slightly different. You know, the usual proprietary wrap, I mean, was fun. Um, so, as you can see, we've got FLVs and we've got XMLs. So, FLVs, some of these are actual valid audio and video files. These are easy. Because again, you can use FFmpeg to merge them, and that's fine. But the rest of these are not, strictly speaking, media files. They're FLVs containing data used to display the chat box and the uh, file sharing widget and all these other pods that you see in conferencing software. Now, these, without using Flash and reverse engineering their format, which of course is not documented anywhere, uh, could not. I couldn't get to the data, which is why I had to do this. So I figured, OK, um, because the duration, seeing how we're recording it using the uh, you know, FFmpeg X11, right? So we don't really know when the playback begins even, right? So to start with, when you load that uh, SWF onto a browser, the first thing you're confronted with is this. And this takes anything from 30 seconds to five minutes to finish. So in fact, you don't actually know when the session started playing back to you. And you're doing it all automatically. You're not you know, a human being watching it. So you honestly don't know. Uh, so my first problem was to, dis to discern when it actually started recording the session, right? Because I had to, uh, I had to trim the beginning, the uh, Adobe Connect connecting rubbish. 
So I, I thought I might need to do that using uh, FF probe. That's part of the uh, FFmpeg toolset. How many people are familiar with uh, FFmpeg, by the way? Quite a few. Good. So you know what that is. Uh, essentially, it, it gives you metadata about media files. Now, I figured I might have to just do FF probe, looking at two frames at a time, comparing these, and this, the, discerning when this stopped, this connecting thingy, and you know, the recording began. Uh, but after uh, doing some research, I've discovered that FFmpeg has a lovely, lovely feature called scene detection, and it works brilliantly. Now, I'll show you how it works. Mm. All right, so this is our command. Um, can you see that? No, I know what I'll do. Hold on. This is what I'll do. I'll increase this one. We're talking about this one. Okay, so what this does analyzes the frames in the video to determine when the scene changed. This is good because, you know, it shows the progress bar with the connecting for a while, and then the first screen loads up. So it's a massive scene change. So all I need to do is find the point in time within my recorded video, the one I've done the screen display with, to determine when the video actually started and trim everything uh, beforehand, all that loading rubbish. So I'll show you just a demonstration of the scene detection feature outside of this context, because again, I can't do what. Let's run that command. And what it does, well, the way I've done it, is put the scenes into Big Buck Bunny JPEG. So that's originally, that was, that's a video file. It accepts a video file as input detects when the scene changed and captures the frame. Okay, so what you see here is essentially a trail of the changing frames. Now you can adjust the sensibility of that. So for instance here, my choice was, if you can see okay, 0 0.1. Now if I were to change that to say, uh, no, let's just look at what it looks like now again. All right, so... <coughs> These are all frames that changed within that video at that level of sensitivity. Now, let's uh, be less sensitive and do 0 0.4. So we got fewer frames, okay? This feature is very handy, very handy, and it's exactly what I needed. So that helped me. Okay, fine. So now I knew when it actually started playing back. So I could trim everything that's beforehand, all that connecting thing. Now, as far as the duration of the actual recording, I thought I could get that from their API. Sadly, that turned out to be true for about 20% of the assets, and the rest of them didn't have it. So I'm like, blimey, how am I going to get the duration then? And then... I thought, you know, I might have to record like hours and hours and, you know, then trim all the rest of it and throw it to the rubbish bin. And then I figured, okay, but I do have the audio files and these I can merge together using FFmpeg and then I can probe it for the asset's duration. And presumably the audio track and the video track would be roughly the same. And I say roughly because I, I do mean that. Why? When you start a conference, no one's ever ready. Have you ever attended a conference, a virtual conference? It goes like this. Hey, can you hear me? No, we can't do. Now? No. And now? No. And then someone says, yeah, I can hear it. And someone else says, I can't. And you know, that takes like half an hour. And then uh, they start their uh, presentation. And then they lose the audio and then they get it again, and so forth. So it's roughly the same size, but not really. Uh, but, you know, this is what I've had to work with. So if I could obtain the duration from the API when I, when I could obtain it, I did. But otherwise, I had to use this method. So I essentially downloaded the archive I've shown you before, which was easy to do, luckily. 
And then I have just probed the, I've assembled the audio files, because there are multiple ones. Then I had a complete audio track. And then I've probed it for the duration. And this is how I knew when to cut the recording. Now, because of that loading period in the beginning, I had to do a buffering. So two minutes from the, the beginning and two minutes towards the end. So if my duration was originally an hour, I recorded an hour and four minutes. And I was usually OK. And then, except for all the times it wasn't. So then I recorded eight minutes. And that was fine. And then after I've had that, I figured, OK, but I, the customer had over 40,000 assets. I'm like, I can't do this one by one. I need parallel processing. So I thought, OK, that's fine. I've used um, the X-Video Frame Buffer Run utility. Uh, do you guys know it? Oh, you should do. Re get ready to be excited. So what this does, it allows you to run uh, X11 applications, like graphical applications, on the frame buffer. OK, so you can open multiple uh, virtual X displays and run your browser there and record your session. Now, this is brilliant because it means that I'm no longer limited by anything apart from hardware resources. Uh, however, there is a caveat. The audio is a problem when you go about it that way. But that's fine because I've had the audio already. So I figured, OK, so I just need the video display. I'll use Firefox and their uh, SWAF for that. I'll record it. I'll trim it according to the uh, length of the audio track. I'll merge these two together, and we're done. And that almost was the case. Uh, by the way, uh, are you following OK? Am I going too fast? Am I being coherent? Good. I do try. All right. So back to the flow. So first, download that zip archive I've shown you. Use Selenium uh, and the Mozilla uh, Gecko driver. Launch Firefox, record the, set, the session using their own software. OK? Then, uh, once that's done, use scene detection to discern when exactly the session started playing back to us. And then merge the audio and video files together. And the easiest part of all, upload them to our platform. That's very easy to do, I promise. All right. So parallel processing, we were there. OK, so we had that utility. I had to make slight changes to it, uh, but nothing major just to properly support parallel processing. If you need that sort of automation for other things you're doing, uh, you should definitely go for that. And you can grab it from uh, the repository for, um, for this uh, migration tool. Now, like I said, the number of jobs is only limited by hardware resources. So the more resources you've got, the more parallel concurrent jobs you can run. Now, OK, using that method, we were able to obtain a recording of a video that looks exactly like that, only moving. <laughs> OK, uh, I can't show it to you, sadly, again. But so just you know, the presentation, the chat, and so forth, and the audio track. And that, that was fine. But our platform also has uh, what I find to be a very handy ability, which I can demo, not using their assets, but one of our assets. So this is our lovely founder, Michal, and the one who's asked me for help uh, late at night. Now, as you can see, we've got slides and we've got video, right? And they run both in parallel within the player. And you can uh, toggle the uh, display, and you can say, show, me show it to me like that, or show it to me like that, and so forth. Now, what are these, uh, these slides? They're essentially uh, images, right? They're thumbnails of the presentation. And I said, OK, uh, so it would be very nice if I could extract these images from the video and you know, process them as thumbnails so that they, we could have that sort of display, right? So video and slides on the side. Now, also, these have metadata, so you can search for it, which is brilliant. Uh, I don't always have the patience to watch videos. I must say, I mean, I work for a video company, but 
I'm, I'm, I'm a very impatient sort of person. So if you can search for something within the video, that comes in very handy. And uh, these slides, each of these uh, thumbnail objects, we call them cue points, uh, can have metadata. So that's uh, more productive, it's more searchable, you can find more content and discover it that way, and you can search through it and jump to the right slide and, and so on. So I wanted that. Uh, our cue point objects are, like I said, an image representing the slide, the title for the, present the, the slide, description, so basically the content within the slide, uh, its start time uh, in relation to the video, and that's, that's it. So I, I thought of a way, I, I started thinking of a way by which I could uh, harvest that data from the recording I've obtained by means that I've already described. And I, I figured, okay, so let's remember what it looks like. Looks like that. So I said, okay, I need something that would detect all the squares or rectangles within uh, a frame, a given frame, and then I could extract, I, I'll get the coordinates for, the, uh, for this, essentially, right, for the slide widget, and then I could process that. I could uh, take that, create an image out of it, and upload it to our servers and set it up as a cue point. Uh, now, you may be thinking, okay, uh, but couldn't you just get the coordinates once and that's it? Why do you need to detect anything? Because uh, you're allowed to tweak the elements within Adobe Connect, right? So if you're the director of your little session, you can uh, move that uh, widget to the side, you can expand it, you can delete other widgets and get rid of them, you can uh, minimize some of the widgets, so it's not a constant. And so dynamic detection uh, had to be done. For that, I've used OpenCV, and I've uh, created a small demo for you. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is what it looks like. Now, let's detect. Right, so these are all the squares within our um, frame, okay? So naturally, I need this big one, okay? Now, how do you know which one to take? That can be a bit complex, right? I went under the assumption that it will be the second biggest. Why? Because the first one is this, right? The, the, the browser screen. And then the second biggest is the presentation widget. <laughs> this is almost always true. So, you know, within a margin of error, I was able to get that done properly. Uh, an alternative to that, by the way, uh, eventually the customer didn't like all my fancy schmancy features. So he said, uh, this is very nice and impressive. I liked it better beforehand. And, you know, you've done a good job. Shut up. So I said, yeah, fine, I, I can take yes for an answer, so, okay, um, so I, I dropped it. But thinking about it, another thing I could have done, because um, OpenCV uh, can also do text detection, and it can actually find words within a frame, and because presentations and slides usually consist of words, I could say, okay, find a very big square within certain limits, and then verify that it has words within it. And then I could be almost positive because it's a big square and it has words in it. It's like how you describe a presentation for, no one, for someone who's never seen something like that, right? It's, it's a big square and it has images and words, okay? That's a slide. So something like that, right? Now, there are problems with this approach, and I'll show you some problems, because we all love problems. So, this looks nice, okay, that's my, present, my, that's my slide. Next up. Ah, this is uh, a bit of a problem, eh? I mean, you see that? It's no longer a square, it's like something. So, it's not guaranteed. This method 
depending on how you've built your slides and your theme for the slides, may f up slightly. But generally speaking, even so, I mean, it, it would have taken, in this case, the big cube, the big uh, uh, semi-rectangular here, and processed it. So even though a portion of it is cut, it's still, you know, you can make it out. So it's not that bad. Uh, but it's not a perfect method. Now you see here, uh, same thing. Why? Because let me show you the original again. Let's do them uh, side by side, maybe. So, wait a minute. Right, so that's the uh, detected one. And that's the original. So you see, it gets confused because of this line. That's part of the slide. It's part of the theme for the slide. And that confuses it, this thing. So it's not bulletproof, but it's nice, and it's still beneficial. Uh, for the metadata, I've found that they, uh, Adobe keep XMLs with the uh, uh, actual strings within the slides. So I've used that. That was easy enough. Um, and what I, so essentially, I've, I've used the uh, scene detection feature again. And I said, give me all the changes. And then I knew when they changed the slide. Because the screen is mostly static. Uh, let's uh, remember again what it looks like. That's mostly, nothing ever changes dramatically when they give a session, apart from their uh, switching the slides. So, you know, the chat gets a bit of action, but we don't care about that. So, basically, I'll show you the code for this. How much time do I have? Oh, I see it. All right, sorry. Nothing. I've said nothing. Um, handle slides one. Right, so essentially what this does, runs this command to detect the scenes, uh, FF probe, show frames, so on and so forth, select, and then scene, and the level of sensitivity. Uh, I didn't want it to get too high, because then uh, slight changes in the other widgets affect it. So after, you know, trial and error, this is the best uh, setting for this sort of project. Uh, and then I grab the PKT PTS frame time, and that's what I need. And I'll put that into a text file. And I just do that, and then what I get in the end is something that looks like this. Hold on. Where did we put it? Okay, like this. So just the numbers, the, the time within the video when a change of scenes happened. Okay? Now, when I take this, once I have it, I can use FFmpeg to extract an image out of that frame. And that's what I do, same as I've shown you with that uh, Big Bunny video. Right, so detecting the scene changes, then creating an image out of each frame when the, the scene has changed. And that gives me the slides, basically. Um, so, simple enough. Okay. Uh, right, that's what I've explained. Right, this is credit. We'll talk about credit. Some people deserve it. Um, okay, other challenges. So, like I said before, I've had this issue with um, when, to, when has the recording actually started and ended. Uh, for this, let's, view the, let's look at the code a bit more, because we have time, which is nice. I'm usually out of time. I never get 50 minutes. I don't know what happened to Christoph. He never gives me 50 minutes. Always 20. All right. Thank you, by the way. So we start with the AC wrapper, AC being Adobe Connect. Let, let's look at what that does. Uh, can everyone see OK? Yeah, good. Right. So checking for some necessary utilities. Uh, uh, X video frame buffer run and X video frame buffer 
safe is my code uh, attending to the uh, concurrency issues. Okay, so I needed that. By the way, uh, the repository, it's in the uh, resources slide, but just to show you anyways. Uh, it's AGPL, so you may use it freely. Uh, and actually, we'd like you to migrate to Kultura, but it's not mandatory. I mean, if you just want to get a flat file for the video recording, you can do that. Uh, could the general algorithm could be adapted to other, you know, proprietary platform for web conferencing. Uh, I don't know, just uh, WebEx, for instance, or others, uh, where uh, similar action is going about. I mean, it's going to be different. The format's going to be different, but the overall idea is similar. Um, so AGPL, uh, like I said, uh, there is a rather extensive readme, a nice setup script too, so you don't really have to work very hard. Uh, and of course, contributions are most welcome, so if you're interested, uh, just any pull request would do. Um, what I wanted to show you was the XVFB run safe. Now, this is an all-purpose script, so if you need that sort of automation, you can just grab that. Runs standalone, doesn't have any dependencies other than XVFB run <laughs> and whatever that brings along with it. Okay. All right. So, uh, we start by uh, setting the max concurrent procs we're willing to run. Again, that varies depending on your hardware. Um, you, can all set, you can set all of that in an RC file. All of these values are just plain shell uh, environment variables, so it makes it very easy. Uh, if they're not set, sometimes I set a default for you, like in this case, seven. Why seven? I don't know, it's a nice number. Um, I mean, I like 73 best, but that's in my tie, so I went with 7. Right, uh, so we start by processing the uh, list of recordings we want to migrate. That can be a mighty long list or a short list, doesn't matter, uh, but you just set it, it's a very simple format. Um, I didn't want to get too fancy. Uh, so SEO ID is like their asset ID, okay, they Every asset session has one. Uh, category name is, I've used their uh, structure for that. So if, if you're like a university, you'd have, uh, I don't know, CS faculty and then uh, machine learning and then, you know, so subcategories. So that's the one. Uh, and our platform, of course, also supports categories. So we could migrate the content and create these categories as to uh, sustain the same structure the original system had. All right, uh, meeting the name, its description, ID, blah, blah, blah. And then the date uh, it was created and the owner for that video. So uh, our system, by the way, also supports custom metadata. So you can create whatever fields you'd like and expand the scheme. So whatever they've had, we were able to easily migrate onto ours once we've fetched the data. Uh, so that was easy. Okay, uh, then we launch um, the, frame, the XV frame buffer uh, utility. And we launch it as many times as we've allowed with the max concurrent procs. And if we've exceeded that, then we're just waiting, you know, for something to terminate to finish. Um, so that's that. And that calls um, another script, and that's the Ruby part. So that's AC new. Why new? Because I first called it ACRB, and then I refactored the hell out of it, and now it's called AC new. I'm lazy. Anyways, um, right. It uh, doesn't have many dependencies, so. A bit of JSON, uh, Selenium, you know, for opening the browser and so forth. Uh, open free, uh, fine. And Logger and our own client library for Ruby. Uh, so that we can ingest the content that we've uh, created uh, by following this procedure onto our platform. Uh, like I said, this is not mandatory. So the platform is also capable of just producing the file. I am very much opposed to vendor locking. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, so I created it in a way that it can be used with other platforms. We're not 
were utterly agnostic. All right, uh, now as far as what it does, I'll briefly walk you through it. So we need the uh, um, Adobe Connect endpoint, which we'll uh, use in Firefox later on. A bunch of other uh, variables. So uh, where to output to, the meeting name, these are all exported from the wrapper script I've shown you. Right, or well, maybe we can show them side by side, just for fun. All right, so we, we basically export these, and then the Ruby file reads them. Oh, we verify that we've got of everything we need. And we get cracking. So we check if there is an audio track in that uh, zip archive, and we process that like I've explained before. And we start by getting the duration for that. Okay, and we delete the new line from obtaining the duration because this is done, you know, you, we run it by command line and then we have to trim the new line. Oh, and we report failures because we're nice. Okay, this one grabs the screen display of the browser playing the asset using their Adobe SWF. Let's dive into this function. Okay, so... Um, accepts the uh, path to FFmpeg. If nothing uh, is passed or set uh, in the environment variables, just uses whatever it's in the path. Uh, word of advice, FFmpeg 4, far better. And it's the latest, use, use the latest uh, if you can. Um, I also have a side project for uh, building FFmpeg completely statically, uh, which comes in very handy. <coughs> So if you ever need that, it's this one. Uh, and that would produce one binary file for FFmpeg, another for FFprobe, uh, utterly without real-time dependencies. Now, naturally, this is ill-advised in many situations, but sometimes you need to, and when you need to, you can use this one. Huh. Does that yes, everything. LibSDC, LibC, whatever you want it includes. My mom's in there. She saw a bit of a lag, but she's a nice woman. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> right, I shan't show it to her. Well, okay. So, uh, anyways, uh, x11 grub basically just calls this command um, resolution, frame rate. We've gone with uh, something rather traditional. I'll show you where that's defined. Don't want to be too fancy, so 30. We've gone with 30, and that, that was all right. Resolution is this. Okay, uh, now this is interesting. Why do I have to crop? I had to crop because there was a bug in the Selenium uh, Mozilla Geeko driver that when in completely full screen, it crashed quite miserably. It was so sad. So, you know, I reported it, and naturally, eventually, it got fixed long after the project ended, but it got fixed. But in the meantime, I figured, okay, so I shan't do full screen, and therefore, I had to trim the, uh, you know, the browser's bar, you know, the address bar and all the menu options and so forth. So that's the cropping. So I just crop a few pixels. I shave them off the top where the uh, menu bar and all that rubbish is. Well, I'm talking about, oh, uh, boy, this image comes in very handy. Hold on, let me show it to you again. Yeah, so, you know, this portion, okay, the window frame, the window decoration. I had to, to crop that out. Cheers. Um, okay, and then uh, if that worked okay, then we're happy and we're continuing on, and if failed miserably, then we log the error, and we hope someone knows how to fix it. Okay, uh, next stop, after getting the screen recording, comes the scene detection, right? Like I said, we need to find the first scene after the bloody progress bar. Uh, let's all be reminded of that progress bar. This one, it's a beaut. 
So we need to find the first scene when that's changed. All right, next up, uh, trim in the video. So, right, we've got the first scene. So we say, OK, let's say playback started at uh, 1 minute 39. So we're throwing away all the first minute and 39 seconds of the recording. Right, good. Uh, and we use the uh, audio file duration as basis for our expected duration. Usually, there are some uh, subtle, interesting, very interesting cases, but I won't go into those now. OK, um, audio track, merging these two, uh, checking whether or not, and then we're done with processing the file. And we have one cohesive uh, MKV file that can be played with most modern uh, video players. And now we can ingest that onto our cultural platform uh, if need be. So if these variables were set, then we do the ingestion. Now, <coughs> ingesting with Kultura is very, very easy. I'll show it to you because A, we're a very nice company, and B, well, you know, they paid for the trip, so. Um, okay, there you go. So we get a client, the entry name, which is usually the meeting name, uh, the Adobe meeting name, meeting ID, uh, which we set as a tag for reference, right? So that whenever someone opens it in our platform, they'll be able to tell what the source was for that uh, on Adobe Connect. Uh, and our platform also supports uh, chunked uploading. So if the asset is very big, you can split it into smaller files, right? And then upload them in parallel. And then naturally it uh, makes for faster uploading time. Uh, in this case though, because these files are very small, it's essentially just you know, one slide that changes. So they're not very massive at all. Like a, a huge recording of two and a half hours were about, was about 17 megs. So we didn't really need chunk uploading. <coughs> But um, it's an option. Right, and we create an upload token. And we create a new media entry in our platform. And we use that token to ingest the uh, resulting um, recording of the session after all these previous manipulations. And uh, that's it, uh, pretty much. That's the process. Uh, and we create some additional metadata, like I said, uh, to comply with what they've had in Adobe Connect. Right, uh, I'm, I reckon I'm done, um, so I'll break for questions. I was either very, very precise or very, very boring. Yes. Okay, I don't have an important question, a very boring question. Do you have to use DOS to Unix often in your shell scripts? Sadly, because I get input from loads of Windows users, yes. Yes, sadly. How about you? <laughs> we can commiserate later. I, I, I can see a fellow sufferer. I can always, always spot them. Another question? You talked about 40,000 rollouts. Are these scripts run by users, or where do they run? Oh, uh, so the customer wanted to run it by himself, and that was fine by us. Um, we just gave him the code. And a colleague of mine, a lovely, lovely friend, by the way, that reminds me, let's do the credits before I forget, because I'm notorious for forgetting, and I'll never forgive myself. So, sorry, uh, just one, one second. So, uh, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for all the open source projects that I've used. I couldn't have done it without them. Uh, next up, my, friends and my friend and colleague, Hila. Uh, so, she's joined this project after the POC was done. And she's uh, been amazing supporting the customer and, you know, helping them troubleshoot their own issues and so forth and investigating the few assets that did not work out. So, Hila, I hope you will watch it. Cheerio, and well done. Uh, and also to Jack Sharon. He's our solution architect. He's done some research, and he's uh, always believed 
that this is possible, uh, and thanks to Jack T. Go on, sorry again. So, I mean, do the 40,000 users run it, or do, does it say no, IT no, department? No, one, no, one person okay. running it on 40,000 entries. They've set up several VMs, uh, all running Ubuntu, even though we're not limited to Ubuntu necessarily, but they've used Ubuntu 16.04, and they've set it up. There's uh, a very simple setup script. I'll show it to you. Uh, let's find it, and then we can show it. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing how they've chose Ubuntu, I've, uh, I've created the script to support that. Uh, mm -hmm. This. Okay, so uh, can you see that okay? just deploys all the necessary dependencies. Naturally, it needs the uh, Flash plugin to load that SWF. Uh, a few others are uh, very easy to set up and then just set up um, your uh, environment variables according to your needs and you're done. And then, so they've run that and then they've just run the wrapper, giving it uh, a full list of all their 40,000 recordings. Uh, naturally, they divided it among several machines. Other questions? Anything else to us to, to add, Jess? Um, there are other utilities I have to use. <laughs> That's in response to your question. Uh, no, just thank you very much for attending, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Jess. <laughs>